working in the yard in my summer coming home from college. It was a lot of good memories and I used to be teased a lot by a lot of the workers because I was, as they used to rephrase it, the boss's son. So, you know, uh, but they were great and uh, I learned a lot of things from those gentlemen from all over the so sure who worked at the yard. Well, it was basically around the time the Blunus II was built. I would work in the supply room, handing out nails and whatever the shipwrights would come in and look for those and I'd hand them out or any tools or whatever they needed. And then I also, I was the guide on the Blunos to uh, what they were doing was, someone came up with the idea, I think it was my uncle, but what they do is they gather up all the chips, the uh, wood chips, and they put them in bags and they sold them for I think a dollar or a dollar and everything like that. So it was really interesting what they made out of that because people were asking, oh, can I do that, right? You know, and, and you'd be there, sure. So then after a while they got the idea, well, maybe we should sell some of these. So that's what happened. So then when the Blue Nose 2 was launched, I was on it. I was fortunate to be on the boat when it was launched. And when it was being built, I'd go up the mast and do some of the uh, work up on the mast. And it was a long way up for a 16-year-old boy. So <laughs> I, I did that. Uh, and then finally, uh, last few years, when I'd come from college, it would be working in the, our family yacht shop, which was adjacent to the shipyard. So that was a lot of my thing. But And I guess some of the best experiences were like, <laughs> One funny incident was Dad wanted uh, one of the buildings, the wharf buildings, painted. So he assigned myself and a friend of mine and, and uh, one or two of the men from the yard. So we started painting it and then, then we got the great idea of a paint sprayer. <laughs> I, of course, being a rookie, sprayed into the wind and of course it all came back on top of us. But these are just some of the memories I have there, so there are a lot of good ones. I didn't really get a lot of stories from my, like I say, my grandfather. I was very young when he died. So it would be from my father and, and uncle. And my uncle would be the one more so coming from it because dad wasn't with the company right at that time. There was a myth out there that we changed the bow or something like that, and there's no truth in it. That's the way it was built, and that's the way she stood. I do know the building of most of it, except for maybe a bit of wood, was all done at the yard. I mean, they would do the wood knees, and they used to have a mill down there, and they'd have this big steam machine. they put it in there, and that's how they would bend it and do whatever, the frames and all that type of thing. So it was kind of interesting. When they were building the Blue Nose Two, we did the, they did the same thing. We went up in the sail loft where my uncle had his thing, and it'd be up in the loft, and we'd pound these nails in all around, and you'd get the line out, and you'd do it for the ribs and things like that, how to shape, and that and that was uh, awful on the knees, but it was quite an experience because you were actually doing it the way they originally did it. I have a whole trunk of all tools that were used on the Blue Nose and the Blue Nose too. They're all wooden ones, right? The old style. It's really neat. And the instrument most used was called the NADS, A-D-Z-E. They take the ads and there'd be three or four guys and they'd be chopping around and doing a rounding it off for the ribs and for the mass and things like that. But the ads was a key component of making the mass for the Blue Nose and, and, and not only that, uh, Marjorie and Dorothy and all these other, Caroline Rose and whatever, all those other ships of the same era as the Blue Nose. This is the original uh, half model. Can you hold it up? Okay. That was used to build the Blue Nose along with the blueprints. And uh, again, I've kept it in the family. And it is quite a, it says on the thing there, original schooner Blue Nose model, built 1921, 
Smith and Rule Limited. The one thing it doesn't say on it is, is that it was the 119th hull built at my family's business. Well, I have them. <laughs> uh, I was glad, uh, lucky enough to be given to them by, by my, both my uncle and my father. And I do have them and I treasure them. Um, uh, I have plans after, it's up to my, my children what they want to do with them. And hopefully if they're not going to use, have them or whatever, that we could donate it to the museum. The legacy of the Blue Nose is something I think at that time, that period, all Canadians and especially Nova Scotians and Lunenburgers uh, felt that that was, because the Blue Nose touched the everyday person. I mean, you look at the fishermen that went out there in those boats and in those stories, I think it was a real love affair between the people and the Blue Nose and the crew was that these were everyday working people doing their job, doing it for their country and town and their families. And I think because of that, everyone embraced them very, very, very much so. And I think that was all due to that. And then to say, when we were racing the Americans to beat the Americans, we're Canadians, America's so big, America has this, America has that. And to do that as an, you know, the ordinary Canadian, I think it just inspired everyone. This is a picture here of the crew at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, of which Captain Angus Walters and his regular crew took, I think, six to eight young sailors there. One was my father, another was George Wynock, another was actually Angus Walters' third son. They were on their way to the Chicago's Fair. This is in Montreal when they were on the lake going to Chicago. This picture was taken. When I think about it, she'd be back and forth at Gloucester quite a bit. And even the Gloucester people loved this boat, even though it would beat their boat all the time. They, it was, when the Blunas came in, scores and scores of boats would come in to meet it. So going to Gloucester, going to the World's Fair, going up to Montreal, all the things that happened were just, I think, you know, if, if you live in Quebec or you live in Ontario, let's say, you don't see a schooner like this every day. So when it comes in, it just the look of it is a drawing card. So people, so whenever the Blue Nose and even the Blue Nose too, when they go up to any port, whether it be on the Great Lakes, whether you know, down south, whatever, it would be, wow, let's go look at that. I want to see what that's about. I met so many people and I joined so many organizations and of course, one of those visits led me to the Fisheries Museum. Well, this is where it all started, in the Fisheries Museum. So who should I run into there and ask a question but Ralph Getson? Now Ralph, I have to say, worked with me on this Blue Nose Builders project. And when I asked him who built the Blue Nose, this all started with him saying Smith and Ruland. No question. No question. Smith and Ruland is where it all started. And this is a picture of them uh, way back in the early 1900s. 
and down at the shipyard, which they created in 1900, uh, they built 119 ships, and so we're well able to look after the Rui plan for Blue Nose. When that occurred, they had to hire men. When I asked Ralph, who were these men? His response says, nobody knows. I said, how is that possible? Lunenburg without Blue Nose wouldn't be here. Um, Blue Nose without Smith and Ruland wouldn't be here. And Smith and Ruland wouldn't be here without the workers. So who built it? Didn't know. I said, why? He said, because the records were all burnt when Smith and Ruland sold out, I think, in 1960s, 70s to Scotia Trawler. So the yard closed down and they carried all the records out of the offices and burnt them. Well, another good news story. Into that fire went Klein Falkenham. Now Klein ended up building your Blue Nose too, largely uh, at the Smith and Rulin yard, but was in a shed. Now working in a shed over the winter is not a big problem. But realize the original Blue Nose, everything was done outdoors. And that happened just slightly to the left side of the Blue Nose 2 building as you look at it. So the Blue Nose original was built there. Blue Nose 2 was built inside the shed. And that, for me, became territory that was virtually hallowed. And this is where the men toiled. I have to say that in no way at any time did Ralph disagree with the project. But he has his own duties. And I couldn't take him, I couldn't ask him to take time from that. But he went through everything I came up with, he went through with me. And eventually we came up with a list and as far as it went, uh, I worked on it until, well, for, I guess, 12 years. And uh, I, I thought I'd exhausted uh, the names. Ralph considered that it could be between 40 and 52, and I only ever got as far as, as around 40. I'll read you the list. Can I read the list uh, of the people that we have? Okay. So I'll come to that. So Blue Nose uh, uh, was started, the keel was laid in 1920. It was 119th ship by Smith and Ruland. It was launched in 1921 and March the 26th, which is this anniversary of 100 years. It was sold in, I think, I believe 1946 uh, by Angus, who then owned it, and it was sold to the West Indies as a cargo vessel. She was lost in January of 1946 off Haiti. And I'm starting to cry again now because I could still sense her going down and, uh, and none of the parts, none of the pieces of it that I'm aware of were saved. It was all gone. Well, <coughs> that led me to looking into some books, and I found, uh, before I get to who did it, there people all over the world know about Blue Nose because there was books and books and books and books. And I listed just a few of them. Not all of them I have read, but I've tried to find them and I've tried to over the years. But Heather Ann Getson uh, was at the museum, and she built all, the Ocean Knows Her Name, which was a beautiful book. Now, a fellow by the name of Mark de Villiers, he wrote Witch in the Wind. Uh, Mark came to me because he knew I was interested in Blue Nose, and I introduced him to Klein Falkenham, and he interviewed Klein for days. And I have to suspect that a lot of his uh, information came from Klein Falkenham whose dad 
was, was one of the original builders. With Klein, it should be noted, when he joined the yard, there was no such thing as calling a, a, new, a new one by their name. He was Howard's son. So maybe the first year, he was boy. Hey, boy, do this boy. So it was probably a year before they started to call him Klein. And of course, he went on to a great future with Smith and Rulin. Now, Joan Rui also wrote a book, uh, A Spirit Deep Within. It's a moving book. And uh, Monica Graham wrote, wrote a book, Keith McLaren, Robert Hurdle, L.B. Jensen wrote Saga of the Great Fishing Schooners, which principally was Bruno's, uh, Andrew Merkel, Jacqueline Langell, Devin Kaiser wrote uh, On Board a Vessel. Well, she sailed on it uh, uh, and was a crewman and worked at the museum and a spectacular mind. And she wrote a very, very nice book. Helen Creighton wrote a book. Uh, now, the, the list goes on, of course, because this, this ship is of interest throughout the world. Uh, some of the things that I worked at, and this is a list of them, rather long, I'm sorry, but it has to do with the efforts and where we made uh, inroads and not. And one of the things that has to come out of this is that Ralph and I both, because of the interest out in the community and, and around, uh, we'd receive uh, people, uh, emails from people saying, oh, my father, my grandfather worked on the Blue Nose. So we take down the name and all the information, not always, but most often we found they were born in 1920. Uh, 1946. Uh, they came from Finland, they came from Scotland, they came from all over the world. So this was the interest out there. Everybody thought their grandfather or father, mainly grandfather, had worked on Blue Nose because people had a penchant for going and speaking of how they were involved with Blue Nose, even though Blue Nose was 10 years old. And who was to refute them? So we would go through that list, but some of the things that we did, methods to use, if I can read them for you, uh, we wrote letters to the editor at the Progress and the Herald. Pretty constant, I must say. We had Sandra Devlin, who did genealogy, do an article. I joined the South Shore Genealogical Society and drove everybody up there mad, so they don't, they, they, they're, they're all gone, I'm gone. Uh, the Fisheries Museum, I haunted. I'm sure Ralph was distracted and sick of me because sometimes he was busy. <laughs> Couldn't understand that. Uh, the museum, the Maritime Museum I frequented, uh, which they didn't have a lot, but had some very interesting people to talk to. Uh, the Nova Scotia Archives. I spent days and days back and forth to the archives looking for their records. They didn't have much. The bulletin boards all over this community and all over Bridgewater, I put up uh, uh, notices uh, asking for information. We did a brochure handout, created a brochure down at the museum, printed it off. I carried them by the bundle and delivered them to every store and every person who would pass me on the street. And I'm sure they, I'm not sure what they thought. Uh, I did obituaries, constant, constant, constant. Get a name, and the first thing I'd look for is the obituary. When were they born? Well, this gave me a clue as to whether if it was 1800s or, or even 1900, then they might qualify worth looking into. Most obituaries that I got were, they were just too young. Uh, there was a column by Kieran's. Uh, the FMA had a blog. Huey Corkum probably has got the most complete file. And his dad used to be the police chief here, but I should mention before that he was a rum runner. 
and it has a great story. So Huey Corkum wrote a book, a book, but it was about his rum running days. Uh, Clem Hiltz. Now Clem Hiltz apparently sailed on the original Blue Nose, and I talked to him oh, a long, long time, but it was difficult to discern the facts from his stories. His stories were just really great. Uh, Captain Matt Mitchell, who came here and has recently been on Facebook, along with uh, Hanlon. I worked in the museum in the model shop for 10 years, and people would come by, and Gerard was at the dory on the second floor, and he would regale people. So I learned a lot just listening to him. And when he had no one there, he would come over to the windows at the model shop and talk to us. And it was always a thrill because he was just full of information about Blue Nose. And he himself was an absolute prince of a man. Uh, I visited Klein Falkenham, and Klein is a treasure trove, or was. Uh, he, he was gone not long after that, but I was so happy to have met him, visited him in his house. Uh, I was there at the time that his wife passed. And then his daughter from Dalhousie, she got ill. So Klein had a, a rough time, and a rough time getting around. And of course, his car and his garage was down on a slope. Uh, the Mason's Lodge here, uh, because so many people were, were Masons that were involved with Blue Nose, that I thought they might have a list. They did not, but nevertheless, they opened their books to me and I had a lot of information come from the Mason's Lodge. The <coughs> Herald Community Events was an article and I was able to post in that. I gave talks at the museum when they would allow me, as you can see I talk too much. <laughs> uh, I did library talks at all the local libraries and in Halifax. I went on Facebook and I did, I made up a YouTube video. It was proposed, but didn't come to be, because the list just wasn't complete. Uh, I looked at tax forms for the 1920s to see who, who paid income tax. I talked to Gerald Keddy, who at that time was an MP, uh, and anything I wanted in the government, he was just extremely helpful. Now, Joan Rui, I had a conversation with her, and she wrote just a fantastic book, and was a delight to chat with also. Monica Graham was an author. Uh, Keith McLaren, Heather Getson, I've mentioned. I set up an email address so that when I posted anything, I could put an email address on it. And that ultimately became Blue Nose Workers, at Gmail, and uh, it's demised now. Uh, I visited the Bridgewater Mall anytime they had an open house there at on their uh, on their floor. I was able to put up a picture of Blue Nose and sit there with my book and ask about Blue Nose Nose names. I was interviewed by CBC and TV several times. Uh, I did radio interviews with CBC, which went across Canada. I had uh, Melissa Snyder, one of the Snyders, had a lot of papers, and she gave me access to the papers. I had Klein Falkenham's papers. Not a lot of this had to do with the builders, however, of Blue Nose. Uh, I had the Smith and Rule and Pay sheets. Now what happened, as I mentioned, Klein ran into a fire, but he saved the, the pay records from 1935 to 1940, and they're now down at the Fisher Museum. Uh, but that didn't help for 1920. But there were a number of people still working in 35 whose names did correspond. Uh, to, for what it was worth at those at that time, the dory mates were operating, 
So I became a member of the Dory Mates, met a lot of great people, and it was a great organization to be with. Uh, I visited the veterans ward often up at the hospital, local hospital, uh, to talk to the elderly, to see if they had any memories, and it was just great to talk, talk to them. Uh, the last one I remember talked to up there was Vernon, whose dad owned the, uh, the shop where all the iron work was done, Kemp Street in the corner. It's now a distillery, <laughs> which is where all of this is going to show next. Then I, I visited the cemeteries. So all the local cemeteries I went to and inscribed names and took down anything that mentioned Blue Nose, of course, was, was put in. So that was a list of the avenues that were researched to find the names of who built the Blue Nose. And I will come to the names of the people that built the Blue Nose. One other thing that we did do is we, with the brochures that we had made, we took to all the churches and oft times spoke to the minister and had these handed out. And when they were handed out by the minister looking for names for Blue Nose, they had more power. Uh, I had community mail out. A community mail out was whenever I had an opportunity and the price was right, I'd mail out a request looking for the names of the Blue Nose. So that in effect is how this has been ongoing since 2003. So it gave me a purpose in life, frankly still does, which led me to making Blue Nose products, which uh, kept me alive, kept me interested, and kept me interested in the, in the water, to kept me interested in the sea. And that, that well, there's a story there too. I was born in 1930 in Niagara Falls, but born in a bathtub. Now, there's not a single person on any side of my family anywhere that would have anything to do with water. Wash, bathe, yes, but I was born in it. And I have never, ever lost that respect and desire to be near and on the water. I can recall on the ships, the bigger the waves, and we had many, uh, I would stand out on the Swansons and watch the waves roll by. The story about Blue Nose when she went to England, so that would have been 1939. Uh, I was at the coronation in Niagara Falls when the King and Queen were there in 1939, but Angus actually went to England and took the ship. But when they come back, they nearly sank. They had one of the most fierce storms. And what would happen with my experience, we went to England for the coronation in 1952 and three. And on the way back in 53, we almost foundered in an aircraft carrier. We could not get out of 70 foot waves. And all of the bow anchors were stove in. Uh, the ship was a mess. We lost aircraft overboard. And that story goes on. I created a, a, a story, or in, and this was in 2016, as to who built Blue Nose. And I've said here, in truth, using a well-worn phrase, we may say, it could not have been done without them, meaning the builders of the Blue Nose. There is a dichotomy at play between past and present Lunenburg and area residents. Lunenburg would not be today what it has become without the activities of these few workers in number, truly unsung heroes of another era. Remarkably, the British lured a largely agricultural community to locate in Lunenburg with promises of farming. However, in the final analysis, their existence was become largely dependent upon the produce of the Atlantic Ocean and their method in which it was harvested. In fact, the drawer of water was to become literally the hewer of wood. 
and there are just so many stories behind what led Lunenburg in the direction of shipbuilding as opposed to farming. The farming community, frankly, moved out of town. Initially embarking on yet another new and risky voyage was the simple hand-carved hull half model. That was the blueprint of the day. This was created by Ruby, who designed it. That led the way to a new industry that has last even unto 2016, when this was written. Uh, and it exists today, but not in the same form. Witness Covey Island Woodworks in the Blue Dream Project, which was the last one in the Blue Nose building at the former Smith and Rulam Blue Nose. But in and of itself, Blue Nose was and is an unparalleled feat. They deserve medals for their accomplishments and contribution, but have received only anonymity. Suffice it to say, and not to diminish in any way, shape, or form, Smith and Rulin, for without them, it couldn't have come to pass, but they could not have done it without the men that worked in that shipyard throughout that winter of 1920. Take these men out of the equation of Lunenburg and let us ask ourselves without them, whomever they are, would Lunenburg be what it is today. Witness a town with no industry, such as shipbuilding. Who is W.J. Rui? Who is Smith and Rulun? Who is Captain Angus? What is Blue Nose? What is Lunenburg? We ended up with 32, but that was not enough. Uh, now, that can't be verified, but Ralph's estimate is more, and ultimately so is mine. So these ultimately are the men that, that built it. Uh, it is alphabetical. Arthur Joseph Buckmaster. Interestingly, I talked to his, uh, his grandchildren over uh, on the peninsula. So Buckmaster, uh, Clarence St. Clair Corkum, C.E. Roy Kraus, Aubrey Deal, Howard Melbourne Falkenham, Charles Hansen, George W. Hebb, Manson Willis Langell, Jacob Arthur Lance, Thomas Essen Levy, Daniel Alexander McIsaac, Harold B. Morash, Edwin Morash, and Solomon Morash, whose construction signs you can see around the town, Adna Nathaniel Mullock, Guy Mullock, Charles Oxner, Gilbert Charles Randall, John Douglas Ruland, Charles <coughs> William Silver, there are more, Richard Wesley Smith of the Smith and Ruland, Angus James Walters, because he did drive the gold spike that the Duke of Devonshire dropped the hammer. Uh, Roy Medford Walters, uh, Gideon Benjamin Wenzel, Arthur V. Westhaver, Oswald Nathaniel Wilkie, Creighton Albert Zink. Now I've put in here Victor Cavendish, Devonshire, Duke of Devonshire, because he at least showed up and made a swing at it. Is he a legitimate builder of the Blue Nose? I think not, but that's for humor. Clifford William Hurtle, Charles William Dauphiny, and lastly, 32, is Garnet Wolseley Burns. 
So that's the list that was compiled over a period of time, years, and I don't know at this point how to improve on it. One of the interesting things that I found in this, uh, the information that I gathered was about William Ruey. He had a theory. William Ruey was a designer of Blue Nose, and so we, we know the ship, we know that he designed it. And in order to come up with that design, these pages represent the principles that he used. Completely over my head, but others out there may get the gist of it. Take the weight of the fish or the freight. That's a known. You take the weight of the hull, the spars, the sails, the rigging, and the stores. That's known. This equals a waterline length of 110 feet with 270 long tons of displacement. Proper distribution of the displacement. Know that a certain ratio equals an increasing progression of underwater bulk to the point of greatest transverse area at approximately 55% of the waterline length aft of the stem and decreasing bulk from that point aft causes the least resistance to bodies moving through the water at the surface. I'm sure everyone got that. Called the wave theory in all modern yachts adhere to this theory. The theory is water excavated by a vessel's forebody when moved through a fluid is carried away to infinity. Not the actual particles but a corresponding bulk by a solitary carrier wave or wave of transition. The cavity formed by the greatest cross-section as the body moves ahead is filled up by a wave of second order or the common oscillative wave of the ocean. Therefore, the body should be shaped in length, distribution of displacement to correspond to the form of a carrier wave of equal length or a curve of versed signs, the run or after body to the length and shape of the front of an oscillating wave or trochard. If so informed, the ship will meet the least resistance in her progress forward. Blue Nose is designated to conform to this theory. In other ways, she is a combination of Gloucester and Nova Scotian vessels having the depth of the former and the breadth of the latter. And if we understand and look at the shapes of Gosser boats, this brings us to another subject, the races, uh, and the local uh, Grand Banks fishing schooners, uh, we could see the difference. And yet this Blue Nose is a combination. This was by W.J. Rui from a book by Joan Rui, page 66 and 67 for those that want to take the time to study it. I studied it, and I still know nothing. <laughs> oh, here's a picture, one of the most fantastic pictures I've ever seen of the ship Blue Nose. It's painted by Jack Gray. Now, Jack Gray, everyone around here would perhaps know. Uh, his son, Michael, still works here uh, in, in, as a shipwright helped me many, many times uh, on my little boat. But Jack Gray, I believe, in HMCS Staticona did a whole entire wall uh, of Blue Nose, and it's there to this day and signed by Jack Gray. So I thought that was absolutely remarkable. Well, interestingly, uh, on last March the 26th of 2012, Blue Nose celebrated her 91st birthday. 
and it may be mentioned that those who enjoyed the fame created by Blue Nose over the past 91 years would have included William J. Ruby, Angus Walters, Smith and Rulin Shipyard operating from 1900 to 1970, and of course the town of Lunenburg itself benefited and its fame was to make it eventually a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There are not that many on earth, but Lunenburg is one of them. Canada as well celebrated Blue Nose. This was uh, in 2012. Uh, and we've seen the ship in 1935 depicted on the 50 cent stamp. And in 1937 becoming the obverse or back of the Canadian 10 cent coin, which remains to this day. Of course, here in Lunenburg, we called it the front of the coin. Now, it's interesting, when that 10 cent coin came out, this a personal thing, that may have led to some of my interest, but I would have been uh, about six years old, starting school, and I did not do well in school. As a scholar, I am not. However, I stole a 10 cent coin from my grandma's purse, because we were too poor to have 10 cents in family. And I took it to school, and I used to sit and draw pictures of blue nose and airplanes. And my mother kept those pictures to remind me of what I didn't do when I was supposed to do. So I guess I can say that my, my blue nose background goes back to uh, this coin that came out and got, it took my interest. We've mentioned that she sailed to England. Uh, she also went to the World's Fair in Chicago in 1935, stopped in Toronto where she was celebrated and, and the people poured down in Toronto to climb around her decks. She was not only a highliner and I should mention that her first trip before she could ever enter a race, she had to complete a Grand Banks trip and haul back her fish. So Captain Angus took her to the Grand Banks. They fished the appropriate time out of Lunenburg and sailed back with such a catch, she became what was called a highliner. And there's even a highliner a business that operates to this day. Uh, down in the harbor. So a highliner was about the highest mark of respect you could get to a fishing boat that, that existed. It has to be said that Blue Nose is credited with never having lost a race, and that's false. In effect, she lost many races, but she never lost a race for the Fisherman's Memorial Cup. Hence, the, the premise that she never lost race. She never lost that series, which made her reputation, of course. History tells us that in tough times, Blue Nose became almost derelict, sitting in Lunenburg Harbor, where she used to be the king of the fleet, or the queen of the fleet, I guess we call it in nautical terms. And she was sold to West Indies Freighting Company in 1942. I'm not sure of the date, but I think that that was it. Leaving her owner, Angus Walters, to lament the loss. We know that there's a big project going on in the Blue Nose Shed for this upcoming uh, 100th anniversary. That's made a very valuable contribution to that area of town. And these buildings are some of them over a hundred years old, which brings another item, the Blue Nose building itself. There's 48 to 50 feet that was taken out off the back end of the seaward end of the building and nobody can, nobody knows exactly when that happened sometimes between 1948 and uh, 19, 
I'm going to say 55. Most people think it was torn off to build the Blue Nose II, but in actual fact, it wasn't. It was taken off, we understand, by a hurricane. But the year cannot be pinned down. But I do have pictures of the 10 windows on the side plus another five. And that's, that's where she used to end. So many uh, shipbuilders and the boat industry has suffered a lot. Although right as we speak now, they're doing a tremendous amount of steel work and, and shore work to prepare for a new, I believe it's a new wharf under the Waterfront Development Committee. That, that is a big project and I think when the wharves get built and the boats get back in there, it will become active again. But right now there's a bit of a lull. Uh, I kept a boat there for 15 years and, uh, and I just loved going down to the yard and the people that I met there, I have to say Alan Altus was one of them, uh, Jamie Rogers was another, and uh, there were just so many people that I got to know over the years that you couldn't resist being, in, being involved with Bunos because they come up every day. So that was part of the fun. So I don't know. I, I don't know what the future will hold. At, at one point, uh, you have pictures. You, when you looked out in the harbor going to bed, and they have widow's walks on many of the homes around here, but you could see up to 150 schooners. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, there was not a ship in the harbor. They had all gone. So the people that took those ships to the Grand Banks are in equal favor as the people that built the ships for them to go to the banks in. As it turns out, at 90, it's been part of my life for 80 years. And looks like it will continue uh, because it's part of my epitaph. <laughs> so, I, so that's borrowing from the future. <laughs>